This is the Tom Anderson Show. Broadcasting live from the KVNT studios. 7 to 9 a.m. Monday through Friday. We talk pretty much every month about a murder or mayhem in the world, particularly in the United States, and one of the most notorious, one of the most uh, unnerving crimes is from a serial killer. And I would venture to say the most famous isn't of recent, and there's some real doozies, folks. The most famous, infamous historical serial killer, Jack the Ripper, Jonathan Hainsworth, the great country and nation of Australia, is joining us now, and he's a teacher many, many years. For decades, he has been researching and writing his first book, Jack the Ripper, Case Solved, 1891. I recommend that as much as this one. The Escape of Jack the Ripper is his latest. We'll venture into why he wrote these, and we'll talk about the details, and pretty unnerving stuff. Jonathan, good morning. How are you? Good morning, Mr. Anderson. Thank you so much for having me on your show. Oh, absolutely. Now, I can already tell you have one of those voices. You'd be a good narrator for a movie. You, sh- you, you should read oh, your own book. You. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Do you have it in audio yet? Uh, no, that, that will probably be coming later. Yeah, you, you would be a good reader of that. Well, let's get into it. Now, you, you, your first book you wrote, Jack the Ripper... It, have you had an interest? Clearly, you have expertise, but in the subject matter. But all of your life, when did when did you get the interest on Jack the Ripper? Because now you've written a second book on it. Hopefully, there's a movie made from it. Oh, I hope so too. What happened, uh, Mr. Anderson, is that about ten years ago, when I was teaching um, a class of senior students here in Adelaide, South Australia, uh, I just introduced Jack the Ripper for a lesson. It was really just a way of starting with something true crime, and then we would lead into looking at uh, the British Empire, and we would move on. But a couple of students noticed that there was a discrepancy between what some of the original sources were saying and what some of the later books were saying, and I couldn't answer their query. I hadn't even noticed it. And so I went away and thought that I would come up with an answer very quickly. But what I discovered from the students uh, original query was that, in fact, the books that had been written about it had misunderstood the original story, and I wasn't quite sure how that had happened. So after a few years of research, as you say, I produced that first book where I believed that I had, you know, come to a conclusion based on the evidence about what had really happened, and I really owe it to those students for talking me into writing a book about it. Can you give us a nutshell? We're going to encourage people to purchase your book, and we'll put a link on our show. Tom Anderson shows, uh, you know, YouTube will make a YouTube video of the interview. So so I'll pitch your book on Facebook as well for people to purchase it. I'm interested. But can you give us an encapsulate or or give us the nutshell of Jack the Ripper, just in a couple minutes sound bite so people understand this? And they heard the name, but they may not understand the... The, the, the issues there with where other people were accused and difficulty solving the crime sure. ultimately what happened. In 1888, in the latter part of Queen Victoria's reign in Great Britain, a series of murders happened in the autumn of that year in which five poor defenseless women were attacked, uh, four of them in the street and uh, strangled and they, they were mutilated uh, after their death and their remains were left in the street. And this caused a sensation in England uh, and, and then around the world because it was one of the first examples of a serial murderer, a, a, a perpetrator who doesn't know his victim until the last few minutes of their lives when he, when he came in a cowardly, sick way, takes away their lives. And, of course, the other thing was he was so difficult to attack and the, the reason for that is partly because this was still an era before there was fingerprint identification or even the ability to differentiate blood types. And therefore, uh, you almost had to catch someone in the act uh, to, because they weren't connected to their victim in any way until that moment that they murdered them. Now, the police, Scotland Yard, they did everything they could. They had hundreds of police in this one 
slum area of the east end of London where the murders were happening of sex workers. And the, the hundreds of police, they, they arrested hundreds of uh, uh, men, but nobody was charged. And there was about a dozen murders over a couple of years beyond that. Now, what we discovered, my, myself and my partner, Christine Ward-Ages, who also is the co-writer of the escape of the Ripper, is that a lot of the books are wrong in saying, oh, well, they, they never discovered who it was, and we will just have to come up with some theories now. What we found was that at the time, a police chief discovered the identity of Jack the Ripper, uh, and it was quite a shock to him, because it wasn't some um, slavery maniac in this slum. It was an, a, a British gentleman, an English gentleman like himself, from the upper classes, who led this double life like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, or perhaps, to use a more modern example, like a Ted Bundy, very handsome, very charming, and um, an extremely lethal towards these particular victims. And this man was Montague John Druitt. Now, Druitt was dead by then. He had drowned himself in the Thames River in a torment state. And therefore, the police chief, to Melvin McNaughton, he decided, well, because the man can't be brought to trial, and because he's related, unfortunately, by marriage uh, of that family to a friend of mine, I'm going to cover it up. We can't be brought to trial. We'll just cover the whole thing up and we'll share with the public that he is sold, the murderer is dead, and he was an English gentleman, but we won't give his name. And then the name was only discovered in the 1960s. Ah, oh, man. It's a fascinating example of back late 1800s, early 1900s, and even more recently until modern day with, as you mentioned, DNA. And when I was a state lawmaker in our legislature here in Alaska, I was one that really pushed for for DNA database inclusion with our police systems. And you understand clearly how remarkable DNA is to solve a crime. Fingerprints were the big deal for so many years prior. Like you said, you almost had to catch someone in the act back then, yeah. and, and someone would not have thought. You mentioned a mongrel or somebody in the streets yeah. deranged. In this case, yeah. Druid was not that. So th- that no, he's a defense lawyer and a man about suspicion. More complex, for sure. Well, despite the many incriminating details pointed at him, why wasn't there more of an investigation? I mean, I, I don't know how many notes were memorialized, but I mean, why why wouldn't they have gone after him? What was it the the idea that he, this is someone of maybe not nobility but of stature, and so it's on just like today's politics. If it's a celebrity's kid or a, or a, a statesman's kid, policymaker's kid, you're not going to go after them. Yes, to a certain extent, that is true because we think that on the night that the murderer killed. Uh, two women within about an hour. Uh, he himself was arrested, and he was sitting in a police station, and he bluffed his way to freedom because of his pedigree. You see. He was the nephew of a very famous Victorian doctor, and so they would have been very nervous about, well, what evidence do we have? He seems to have some blood stains on him. Can he explain that? And we think that he easily explained that because he's been a failed medical student and he was doing charity work in the East End and he sort of said, I just helped someone with a bit of amateur surgery and I've got blood on me. And they would have said, we're sorry to have troubled you. You know, they would have, he would have left with an apology. And so that, as you said, is part of that. It, it, it's that terrible class snobbery that it can't be him. He's a gentleman. We're talking with Jonathan Hainsworth along with his co-author, Christine Ward. How do you pronounce her last name? Aegis? Aegis, yes. Aegis. Awesome name. Well, they have written a book that I encourage you to purchase. We're going to come right back, and we're going to learn more. I have a couple questions. I want to ask Jonathan about his favorite story, one of his favorite stories in the book. The book's name is The Escape of Jack the Ripper. He's also the author of Jack the Ripper, Case Solved 1891, We'll give you links and explain how you can purchase these books. We'll talk about what will happen forthcoming and could there be a movie made? And I I always like to ask authors, how does that work and how do you pitch that? And this would be one 
I think, that would have great interest in the theaters and on streaming because of the fact that it's it's like an iconic story, and it's a story that continues to, to I think, enthrall people that read about it. Stay with us. Coming right back, Tom Anderson Show. This is the Tom Anderson Show, broadcasting live from the KBNT studios, 7 to 9 a.m., Monday through Friday. Talking with author Jonathan Haysworth in Australia. I love these international interviews. The Escape of Jack the Ripper is his latest work. He's written about Jack the Ripper in the past. And Jonathan, I have to ask this. If you type in to a Google search, who is Jack the Ripper? You know what I'm going to say. It's either going to say Montague drew it, or it's going to say Polish immigrant Aaron Kosminski. In fact, if I were to do a little statistical juxtaposition to both, Kosminski comes up more often. You go to the History Channel, history.com, it says here, Australian scientist Ian Findlay extracted DNA from saliva on letters back in the Jack the Ripper days, and it says uh, likely could have been a female uh, that, that sent these letters tied to some of the, uh, the, the fatalities how do you counter that when you lecture, when you distribute your, your book and someone says, no, we don't buy that it's, it's the guy you think did it? Uh, it goes like this. We wondered that too when we first started this journey. And so what we found out was that Aaron Kosminski and all these other Victorian suspects, including Druitt, actually start with the same police chief, the upper-class figure of Sir Melville McNaughton. And what we realised from the available evidence is that McNaughton led the cover-up for the Druitt family inside Scotland Yard because he had a very close friend, a man called Colonel Sir Vivian Magendi, who was a national hero because he was a bomb disposal expert, and he was related to the Druids through marriage, and therefore the whole story came out. Names and everything. The Druids would be ruined, Magendi would be ruined, and the Mill McNaughton wasn't going to have that. So what he did was, he didn't tell the rest of Scotland Yard who Jack the Ripper was. Instead, he created a series of non-suspects, of which one of them was Kosminski, to please the prejudices of the other members of the police force. You see, Nick Norton, who's a very nice person, but he's also very upper class, and therefore by class he outranks everyone in the yard. And so he simply told them, each one of them a different suspect, saying, that's who Jack the Ripper is. When, when really it's Montague Drewer. And the evidence for that is that Aaron Kosminski, by those policemen who thought it was Kosminski, they also thought he was dead. When in fact he only died after World War I. All the other suspects are supposed to be dead or have committed suicide. But in fact, that is only true of Montague Drewer. Makes sense. Also with copycat killings and the proclivities and psychology and psychosis, when someone hears, I mean, back then there were newspapers, there was word of mouth. I mean, there, there might not have been technology, but there was, you know, communications was, there was no better in, in print publication than in London in the late 1800s. So the word got out, and I'm sure there were folks that sniffed around and said, hey, may, maybe I can either copy this or take credit for it. And they had their own That's mental right. problems, including women and including people with precision and the ability to to uh, basically commit the same type of crime. Do you have a favorite short story in the book? We, we have a, a short segment left, about six more minutes, but I would love to hear kind of as a tickler, and then we'll get into how people yeah. can purchase uh, your, your latest book, The Escape of Jack the Ripper. Okay, I'll be as quick as I can. Um, first of all, Christine, who's really the chief researcher of the book, she discovered that Monty through it, um, whom we always knew was a defense lawyer, a uh, barrister. But what was not known until she found it for this book was that 
he had defended a murderer in court. And he had attempted to get his client off by blaming the homicide on a woman who was driven into prostitution by poverty. Now, that is really quite something. I mean, Ted Bundy was never a practicing lawyer. He was only a law student. But Carew really was a lawyer. And here you have the extraordinary thing of a man who is a serial killer defending another murderer in court. And I don't think there's any precedent for that in history. None we could find. Secondly, um, there's a whole episode that, that, that the book uh, showcases, which is really where the title comes from, about how the family, uh, a lot of it is about the Druitt family, discovering that their member has this hideous double life, and what the hell are we going to do about it without having our reputations ruined, our lives ruined. And so they stick Montague in a French asylum, very expensive, out of the way, and it all backfires really quickly because there's a nurse who just speaks English who knows what he's confessing to, and they have to extract him from that asylum and get him back to London. And the third thing I would say quickly is that there were people at the time in 1888 who worked out the motive of Jack the Ripper. They didn't know who Jack the Ripper was, but they worked out his motive, and that was he was a terrorist. He was a terrorist inspired by socialist ideology. He, that's why he kills women only in that slum area. He, could, he couldn't theory do it anywhere in London, but he's trying to bring about um, social reform by rubbing the noses of the of so-called better classes in the filth and muck of, of this impoverished area by killing a few of the women so that the press will say, well, it's terrible what happened to these women, but their lives were already ruined by poverty. Um, so I, I don't mean to seriously suggest to you that, that he was a political actor. He's like the sick terrorist of today who, who, who just want to kill people. That's what they really enjoy. They just enjoy carnage and mayhem. But in their mind, they, they create this image of themselves as somehow on a great mission to do something to, to save the world as they murder innocent people. And Montague Drew it was like that too. I think of the complete psychopaths, like, uh, you know, th think of Anthony Hopkins and Silence of the Lambs, or, or I think of, I mean, real modern day ones, Jeffrey Dahmer in Wisconsin, who, who uh, you know, did horrific things and was a cannibal, yeah. just a complete nutcase, right? I mean, just, just off the charts. Then you think of, you alluded to folks out there, uh, war crimes of, of Hitler notoriety or, or just the basic, as you mentioned, terrorists that doesn't mind the mafia hitman. They're, they're, they may not be psychotic, but they definitely don't have a conscience when it comes to killing someone. And I think you may be correct that there was a social element to this. There was a political yeah. element and it was someone that, you know, their, their Jiminy Cricket, their conscience wasn't their guy. They turned that off, but they weren't out eating and they were not, sorry to be graphic. They weren't out at the Jeffrey Dahmer level, but they were still, maybe, you know, I'm not a shrink, so I don't know if I use the word psychotic. No, I need to remind. Yeah, but, but I get it, and, and I understand that. That's where I think, and I mean this sincerely, uh, we're semi in the entertainment business when we have a radio show. Uh, I hope that this becomes a movie, and I know you agree because, gee whiz, that this really hits to some innovative, uh, you know, in terms of crime solving, but it also touches on uh, what happened over 100 years ago, just like today, cover-ups politicization, uh, uh, protecting family, all the things that we see now, you know, we had HBO's House of Cards or Netflix in America. I don't know yeah. if you watch it with Kevin Spacey. Well, I mean, it's the same crap going on back then. <laughs> Probably you could write a book about Rome. You just can't do the research because there's no documentation, but I'm sure this stuff has happened over the millennia. Sad to say, how does someone purchase That's the book? Right. Jonathan, how, yeah, well, you can, how do we get it? You can get it from Amazon. It was released today. It could be in your local bookshop, or you could order it from Regnery History, the American publisher. Of course. Absolutely. Regnery is one that we work with, and it's one of the reasons you're on the show, and I, I compliment them very much for what they've done. Amazon, of course, Jeff Bezos was just in space yesterday. Uh, Amazon, yeah. big deal, and, and that's likely how I will purchase it. I appreciate the fact that you're on. We're going to make a YouTube video of this, folks. You can see in the link how you can get Jonathan and Christine's book. Great job, Christine, for your research. Jonathan, brilliant. I, I'm a fan already. I'm smitten by your story and your eloquence. I hope you sell 
sell many books, my friend. The book's name is The Escape of Jack the Ripper. Tell me that isn't fascinating. I hope you purchase it. Stay with us.